I went to Luther Jackson for two years, so seventh and eighth grade, and then um, the schools were about to be integrated, and my parents asked me to go to the closest school, which was Fort Hunt. I will say this, I did very well in elementary at Luther Jackson, and then when I went to Fort Hunt, my grades were not that good, and it was because we always got the hand-me-down books. So we, we were like two years behind everything that was being taught in the, um, in the white schools. So um, when I went to Fort Hunt, I was just an average student, which was very, very, um, I was sad about that because I had always done so well in school. Been on roll student all through, you know, elementary through middle school, but then you get there and it was like foreign language because the books were older. Yeah, which discouraged me from going on to college. I I didn't go off to college. Um, however, I did uh, manage to get a job with Xerox Corporation and did well there. Did you experience that when you went to Bryant and? Groveton? That's kind of different. Not so much in Bryant, but when I went to Groveton, I felt like I was behind a little bit, um, you know. But the thing about it, I was an athlete there, so I got a lot of help to make sure I stayed eligible to play football and basketball and stuff like that. I graduated on time and went to college and stayed five years and got a couple of degrees and everything. and And so... I mean, but but Groveton was it's kind of tough, you know. I guess the adjustment and coming from an all-black school to predominantly all-white school. I think we had my senior class. We had thirty-three black kids in my senior class out of about twelve hundred students. How did that feel? Well, the thing is, you know, your parents say you always got to get up an hour earlier when you are challenged or trying to get ahead or get equal. You always have to do, you know, more and more. And, and that kind of stayed with me, you know. I mean, even on the athletic field, I fear I had to do more and more in order to get the breaks or get whatever I deserved. Tell you one instance, I had a guy on the football team named Bob Howman, who we became really good foot, uh, friends, white guy. And I spent a couple of nights over his house, and his car was bombed. His car was bombed that night when I was staying at his house. You know, you go through stuff like that, and, and you know, history is a terrible thing. And for people who know about history, you know, and a lot of people don't want to talk about history. I've seen black guys get beat with those long flashlights, you know, older men for being black, you know, and for no reason at all. But, uh, you know, you just, what can you do? I mean, you can get set up. I went to the drugstore one time and this lady started screaming, talking about, here he is again. And she called the police on me. I had no idea what was going on, you know. But it's stories like that you can tell. Uh, I was in the bed one night. The police came and woke me up. I was accused of being in a gang and beating somebody up. I had no idea what they were talking about, you know. And your parents always have to defend you, and and it puts them out. And you, a lot of stuff you get charged for being black, you know, back then. We never went to restaurants or anything. Finally, in my senior year, and, and we would go to the hot shops oh, yeah. in Alexandria, right on uh, uh, Washington Street. But, uh, you know, to go shopping or something like that, I mean, your mother, parents had to be with you. We were not turning loose in those stores or anything. Your parents had to be with you. I had to stand over and make sure you didn't touch anything, you know, and usually if you pick something up, you had to buy it. I mean, they had separate uh, drinking uh, 
fountains and separate bathrooms. Pay to go to the bathroom. You know. We had to pay to go to the bathroom. Yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, I mean, that was the times and you had to deal with them. And, and uh, it affected a lot of people and it still do. You know, I think about some of the things we had to go through. And my white, a lot of my white friends that I met in school that said, well, we don't think it was that bad back then. I said, you don't know. You wasn't black, you know. Because every day is a different day for you guys. And, you know, I had to look over my shoulder all the time, man, all the time, because you could have been accused of a whole lot of stuff and you had no recourse. We weren't even know? there. We lived in Alexandria before we moved down to Stacy Road where my uh, family, my father built a house. And, um, it was only three, four houses on the street when we moved there, it was a cul-de-sac. And my mom was the one that had the kids, so we didn't really have many people to play with. But there was a white family behind us that had a lot of girls too, so we played with them. And I was four, I believe, when we moved down there. So until I had to go to school, I really didn't know the difference between white and black kids because we always played with them. And then when it was time to go to school, you know, we would talk about going to school, but they went to a different school and I had to go to Drew Smith. So that's when I kind of realized that um, there was a difference in, in the kids. Back then the parents didn't talk a whole lot about what was happening. They, I think they kind of sheltered us um, from a lot of things. Um, they just kept us in our environment. A lot of times, you know, you'd want to do something, say, oh, you can't go over there, and, but not give real explanations on why, unless something happened, and then you would get an explanation on why you couldn't go over there. Um, at least that's how it was in, in my family. Um, I did have, a, have an aunt that didn't have children, and she used to, take us to D.C. to give us experiences on a lot of things. Like, um, we went to the skating rinks, we went to the bowling alleys, but they were in D.C. And we always went to a restaurant at least twice a year. So we did get exposure, art galleries and things like that. But she took the time to um, do that because my parents, well, my father worked like several jobs just to keep everybody fed and clothed and housed. You had to be careful what you said or what you did around people because you never know what kind of repercussions you were going to get from anything. I mean, you just was on alert all the time uh, to be aware of what's going on with you and around you. I know my father used to always tell us, hey, speak up, you know, say what you got to say and keep moving. Um, you know, and I think a lot of the kids uh, that I grew up with either uh, handled it or, and I knew a lot of guys who quit school once integration started uh, at a young age, you know, and I, you know, like Stanley Wilkins, for example, my cousin and neighbor, he went in the front door, went out the back door, man, he said he couldn't take it. He, so um, it was pretty t rough during that time. Um, it was it was it was a little difficult, especially like going to the stores. Um, like we would have to go to a certain end of the counter to order food. Um, I think we already mentioned that when it was time to go to the bathroom, you had to pay, but the white people did not have to pay. And every now and then you'd look up and it would be somebody in the store, like a lady who saw us and she would hold the door open and say, come on and go in here. And, um, you know, that was always nice to go to a nice clean bathroom versus one that they didn't take care of. I'll tell you one of the things, uh, when the girls was a cheerleader and she lived in Bell Haven, and uh, we became pretty good friends and uh, the principal called me in the office and he said, Joe, you got to be very careful with what you're doing. And I go, well, what's that? He said, well, you're getting too friendly with some of the white girls here. 
And uh, I said, well, you know, she was a cheerleader. I was a football player. I said, you know, we would talk and they would help me with some of my studies and everything. And he said, well, I got a call from the parents that they uh, don't care for you to be that close to their daughters or whatever. And uh, so I thought that was, you know, that was the, the assistant principal called me in the office to explain that to me. And like I told you before, the guy that uh, I played football with, they bombed his car. Um, so, and, and, you know, they would want to go into Alexander, some of the kids, and I said, man, I can't go. You know, they, come on, we're going to go in this restaurant or go in this bar. And I said, no. No. I said, no, I'm not going. I don't want to get put in that situation. But they didn't understand that, you know, just because they could go in there. They thought I should be able to go in there. And I'll tell you another example. We had a, a Jimmy Lewis, who was an all-metropolitan basketball player, and uh, Jimmy and those guys. There was a Dixie Pig restaurant yes. on on uh, Route on Route One and Beacon Hill Road, right on the corner. And after a game one night, uh, the white kids said, "Come on, Jimmy, we're gonna go to Dixie Pig and have something to eat." And just so happens. One of the white kids was a cook there. I mean, not a cook, but dishwasher there part time after school. And he walked in there and, and with Jimmy and those guys. And they said his name was Grady Frank. Grady passed away a couple of years ago. He said, uh, Grady, I'm not going to, he can't come in here. I'm not going to feed him. And so Grady told him, said, Well, you know, I work here. He said, But you can take that job and shove it. And him and Jimmy Lewis then walked out of the place. And he said he never went back there again. And Grady was, ended up becoming a big time lawyer in Alexandria. Yeah. Yeah, we could go to that restaurant, but I think we had to go around the side door, around the back or something like that. 